Sentados y descubridos. Buenos días a todos. Se abre la sesión. Se va a proceder a la solemne investidura del profesor Joyad Adeli como doctor honoris causa por la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. Tiene la palabra la señora secretaria general de la universidad, profesora doña María Teresa González Aguado, para leer el acuerdo de su nombramiento. Por favor. Yo, María Teresa González Aguado, secretaria general de la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, en uso de las facultades que me confiere el artículo 68 de los Estatutos de la UPM y el nombramiento otorgado por resolución rectoral de 27 de abril de 2016 de la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, certifico que en la sesión ordinaria del Consejo de Gobierno de esta universidad, celebrada el día 29 de noviembre de 2018, y a propuesta de la Escuela Técnica Superior de Ingenieros de Caminos, Canales y Puertos, una vez oídos los informes pertinentes y en reconocimiento a su amplia trayectoria y decisivas contribuciones en el campo de la ingeniería, se acordó por unanimidad nombrar doctor honoris causa por la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid al profesor Oyat Adeli. Y para que conste y surta los efectos oportunos donde proceda, Expido y firmo la presente certificación en Madrid a 7 de junio de 2019. Muchas gracias. Ilustrísimo señor director de la Escuela Técnica Superior de Ingenieros de Caminos, Canales y Puertos. Por favor, invite al padrino y al doctorando que va a ser investido, doctor honoris causa, a acompañarnos a este solemne acto académico. Señoras y señores, levantaos y cubríos. Señoras y señores, sentaos y, cubri y descubríos. Tiene la palabra el profesor don José Ángel Sánchez Fernández, padrino del profesor Joyat Adeli, para pronunciar la laudatio. Por favor. Señor rector magnífico, señor presidente del Consejo Social, señores vicerrectores, señora secretaria general, señor defensor universitario, señores directores de centros y departamentos, autoridades, profesores y estudiantes, damas y caballeros, estimados todos. Los ingenieros de caminos, canales y puertos que hemos dedicado parte o toda nuestra actividad profesional a la ingeniería eléctrica y electrónica somos una rareza no solo en España, sino también en el mundo. Por eso, cuando descubrí el currículum vitae del profesor Hojat Adeli, me entusiasmé. Como comprobarán, se trata de alguien que ha realizado contribuciones importantes en campos muy variados a lo largo de su vida. Es más, creo poder decir, sin temor a equivocarme, que ha destacado en todas las actividades que ha realizado a lo largo de su vida. Este descubrimiento me convenció de que era un magnífico candidato a doctor honoris causa por la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. 
Tras este descubrimiento, me puse en contacto con el profesor Adeli para pedirle permiso para comenzar el proceso de nominación. Tras obtener su permiso, correspondía al Consejo del Departamento de Ingeniería Civil, Hidráulica, Energía y Medio Ambiente decidir si procedía o no proponer su nombramiento. Pues bien, el día 11 de junio de 2018, dicho Consejo de Departamento aprobó por unanimidad proponer el nombramiento del profesor Adeli como doctor honoris causa por esta universidad. Además, la Junta de Escuela de la Escuela de Ingenieros de Caminos, Canales y Puertos, en la sesión celebrada el día 17 de julio de 2018, aprobó por muy amplia mayoría proponer su nombramiento. Como ya nos han leído, su nombramiento fue definitivamente aprobado por el Consejo de Gobierno de nuestra universidad y por ello estamos hoy aquí en la ceremonia de investidura del profesor Adeli como nuevo doctor honoris causa por esta universidad. El profesor Adeli nació en una pequeña ciudad iraní y pasó su juventud en la Jiyán. Su padre era médico y deseaba que su hijo siguiera su profesión. Sin embargo, él prefirió estudiar ingeniería civil y estructural, es decir, la versión iraní de ingeniero de caminos, canales y puertos, porque pensaba, y le cito textualmente, que los ingenieros civiles construyen civilizaciones. Es posible que esta afirmación nos sorprenda, porque hoy en día, en un país desarrollado, damos por hecho que nuestras ciudades están unidas por carreteras, que hay puentes que nos permiten cruzar los ríos, que tenemos agua en nuestras casas y que, además, ese agua es potable. Nada de eso sería posible sin la ingeniería civil. Obviamente, en un mundo como el actual, todas las ingenierías contribuyen a hacernos la vida más fácil y nuestro trabajo menos pesado y más productivo. Pero en la base de todas las civilizaciones está la ingeniería civil. Sin ella no hay civilización. <coughs> Rosa Adelis se graduó en 1973 por la Universidad de Teherán, siendo el egresado con mejores calificaciones en todos los departamentos de la Escuela de Ingeniería. En reconocimiento de este mérito, durante su ceremonia de graduación, su majestad, el Shah de Irán, le concedió la medalla de educación. El joven Adeli era un admirador de Timoshenko. Stephen Timoshenko, para los que no hayan oído hablar de él, era un ingeniero y académico ucraniano que es considerado el padre de la ingeniería mecánica y estructural moderna. Ha habido generaciones de ingenieros que hemos estudiado y aprendido con sus libros. Como consecuencia de dicha admiración, Adeli solicitó la admisión en el programa de doctorado de la Universidad de Stanford, en la que Timoshenko había sido profesor desde 1936. Adeli se matriculó en el programa de doctorado de dicha universidad en 1974 y obtuvo el correspondiente título de doctor en 1976, con 26 años y solo 30 meses después de comenzar su doctorado. Tras obtener su título de doctor, estuvo durante unos meses como postdoc en Stanford y luego se incorporó a la Universidad de Northwestern durante un año. Sin embargo, su deseo de contribuir al desarrollo de su país natal le llevó a volver a Irán y a incorporarse como profesor en la Universidad de Teherán en 1978. Eran tiempos turbulentos en Irán, para comprenderlo, basta recordar la revolución de 1979, que dio lugar a la actual República Islámica de Irán y la guerra entre Irán e Irak, que empezó en 1980. En esos años, Yad se casó con su esposa, Nagdit Tadmer, que hoy nos acompaña. Con el objetivo de liberar a su familia de las correspondientes penalidades, Yad decidió emigrar con su familia. Hay que tener en cuenta que en 1981 tuvieron gemelos. En junio de 1982 consiguió un permiso de dos meses, sin su familia, para presentar un artículo en un congreso que se celebraba en Estados Unidos. En septiembre de ese mismo año se incorporó a la Universidad de Utah como Research Associate Professor. Un poco más tarde consiguió llevar a su familia y cinco años después todos se convirtieron en ciudadanos americanos. 
En junio de 1983, Daly se incorporó como Associate Professor a la Universidad del Estado de Ohio y cinco años más tarde en catedrático, full profesor, de la misma en el Departamento de Ingeniería Civil, Ambiental y Geodésica. También ha sido profesor en los departamentos de Ingeniería Biomédica, Informática Biomédica, Ingeniería Eléctrica y de Computadoras, Cirugía Neuronal, Neurología y Neurociencia por cortesía. En esta universidad, en la Universidad de Estado de Ohio, ha desarrollado toda su carrera académica y a ella sigue perteneciendo en la actualidad como profesor emérito. El profesor Adeli es autor de varios centenares de publicaciones científicas, incluyendo varios centenares de artículos científicos y 16 libros. Los resultados de sus investigaciones se han publicado en 112 revistas internacionales diferentes que cubren los campos de informática, ingeniería, medicina y matemática aplicada. También ha sido presidente, copresidente, o presidente honorario de varias decenas de conferencias internacionales y miembro del comité organizador o científico de cientos de conferencias celebradas en más de 60 países. Ha presentado 113 conferencias plenarias en congresos internacionales celebradas en 44 países distintos, incluyendo varias en España. Ha recibido 60 premios y reconocimientos por la excelencia de su investigación y de su docencia. Es fellow de la American Association for the Advancement of Science y, según Thomson Reuters, es un investigador altamente citado, es decir, está en el 1% superior de los autores más citados en dos categorías, Engineering y Computer Science. Es editor jefe de tres revistas con alto índice de impacto, Computer Aided, In Civil and Infrastructure Engineering, desde su fundación en 1986 por el mismo. Esta revista ocupa desde hace varios años la primera posición de 126 en la categoría de Civil Engineering. Integrated Computer Aided Engineering, también desde su fundación en 1993 por el mismo. Esta revista ocupa la séptima posición de 86 en la categoría Multidisciplinary Engineering. International Journal of Neural Systems, desde 2005. Esta revista ocupa la vigésimo primera posición de 132 en la categoría de inteligencia artificial. Me gustaría destacar que en estos tiempos en los que el mantra predominante es la superespecialización, el profesor Adeli ha realizado contribuciones muy relevantes, no solo en el campo de la ingeniería civil. Además de ser Distinguished Member de la American Society of Civil Engineers, distinción que solo tienen uno de cada 200 miembros. También ha destacado en informática, es fellow del Institute of Electric and Electronic Engineers, y en medicina, es fellow del American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and de la, y de la American Neurological Association. Ha sido coautor de 16 libros, al menos uno en cada uno de estos campos, incluyendo dentro del área de ingeniería civil, materias tan dispares como el diseño asistido por ordenador, el cálculo de estructuras, los sistemas inteligentes de transporte y la planificación de la construcción. El profesor Adeli es miembro de la Academia Europea, miembro correspondiente de la Real Academia de la Ingeniería de España y miembro extranjero de, la academia, de las Academias Lituana y Polaca de Ciencias. Ha recibido un doctorado honoris causa por la Universidad Vilnius de Diminas de Lituania y es profesor honorario de varias universidades europeas y asiáticas. Ha conseguido además lo que para mí es el mayor de los reconocimientos posibles, que se creen premios internacionales con su nombre. En 2010, Wiley Blackwell creó y desde entonces financia el Hoyat Adeli Award for Innovation in Computing, se concede anualmente y está dotado con 1.500 dólares. En 2011, World Scientific creó y desde entonces financia el Hoyat Adeli Award for Outstanding Contributions in Neural Systems, 
se concede anualmente y está dotado con 5.000 dólares. Finalmente, desde un punto de vista más personal, la vida del profesor Adeli nos envía dos mensajes muy importantes. El primero es que la inmigración enriquece a las comunidades de llegada o de acogida. El profesor Adeli nació en Irán, pero ha desarrollado su carrera principalmente en la Universidad del Estado de Ohio. En 1988, el Senado del Estado de Ohio aprobó una resolución que le nombraba an outstanding Ohioan, es decir, un ciudadano distinguido de ese estado. Este hecho, este ejemplo, debería ayudarnos a combatir la creciente xenofobia que hay en todo el mundo. Y segundo, una sólida formación científica permite destacar en campos diversos. La multidisciplinaridad, que tiene como prerequisito una amplia formación básica, debe defenderse, pues la superespecialización es un obstáculo para la innovación. Una mirada a un problema desde otro campo de especialización puede permitir explorar soluciones que de otro modo no se consideraría. La Universidad Politécnica de Madrid siempre ha proporcionado a sus estudiantes una sólida formación científica. Es una virtud que no debemos de perder. Muchas gracias a todos por su atención y especialmente al profesor Adeli por incorporarse a nuestra comunidad universitaria al haber aceptado ser doctor honoris causa por nuestra universidad. Muchas gracias, Joyat, por servirnos de modelo y demostrar con tu ejemplo que es posible y deseable realizar contribuciones relevantes en distintos y aparentemente distantes campos científicos. Gracias. Muchas gracias, profesor Sánchez. Y a continuación se va a proceder a la solemne investidura como doctor honoris causa del profesor Joyat Adeli. Profesor Joya Tadeli, el Consejo de Gobierno de la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, en su convocatoria celebrada el día 29 de noviembre de 2018 y a propuesta de la Escuela Técnica Superior de Ingenieros de Caminos, Canales y Puertos y en testimonio del reconocimiento de vuestros relevantes méritos, os ha nombrado doctor honoris causa por esta universidad. En virtud de la autoridad que me ha sido conferida, os entrego dicho título y os impongo los símbolos que acompañan al grado que ahora se os otorga. Os impongo el birrete laureado, antiquísimo y venerado distintivo del magisterio. Llevadlo sobre vuestra cabeza como corona de vuestros estudios y merecimientos. Recibid el libro de la ciencia, conservadlo como símbolo de cuanto tenéis y enseñar, y que sea para vos recordatorio de que por grande que vuestro ingenio fuere, debéis rendir acatamiento y veneración a la doctrina de vuestros maestros. Recibid el anillo, 
que la antigua universidad entregaba como símbolo de alianza con la misma y como emblema del privilegio de firmar y sellar los dictámenes y consultas de vuestra ciencia y profesión. Asimismo, recibid los guantes blancos, símbolo de la pureza que deben conservar vuestras manos, signos también de la distinción de vuestra categoría y dignidad. Porque os habéis incorporado a esta universidad, recibid ahora en nombre del claustro de profesores el abrazo de fraternidad de los que se honran y congratulan de ser vuestros compañeros. Tiene la palabra el doctor honoris causa, profesor Oyad Adeli. Please. The, the floor is yours, profesor Adeli. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, rector and distinguished colleagues. I am right here. Okay, can you hear me? You can hear me now. Very good. So, uh, I would like to express my uh, gratitude. I am honored, deeply honored, to receive this honorary doctorate. And uh, I was asked to give a lecture. So, my lecture, uh, first I started with the four decades of computing. And then I decided that will be too long to talk about everything about computing. So today I'm going to focus on a, a subtopic of computing, which is machine learning, a key ubiquitous uh, technology in the 21st century. So I want to start by saying that Spain has produce a great number of world-renowned scholars. Here you see uh, just a few samples. So uh, contribution of Spanish research and scholars to the world is immense. And in particular, personally, I have been inspired by a, a, a Spanish neuroscientist and uh, you see uh, his picture and name here. I hope I can pronounce it right. Santiago Ramon E. Cal, and he's known as the father of modern neuroscience. I am connected to Spain and its people. And you can see that in various ways. I have collaborated with researchers uh, at your university 
and uh, I have had uh, Spanish researchers on the editorial advisory board of my journals. Uh, I'm very pleased to see Professor Enrique Castillo here, who is a distinguished scholar, and he was on the editorial board of my journal, Computer Aided Civil and Infrastructure Engineering, for many years, and I had the pleasure of working with him. So he's a huge asset uh, for the Spanish scholarly community. And in fact, uh, 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 the publisher, Wiley, created a best paper award called uh, Hojer Adeli Award for Innovation Computing. And only one award is given every year, and Professor Castillo received one of them uh, last year. And also, uh, I have another professor, uh, uh, Andina, Diego Andina, uh, who is also a world-renowned uh, scholar and researcher in the area of neural system on the 12 board of my international journal, Neural System. And I choose the board members uh, very meticulously, and they have to be really uh, world-renowned to be on the 12 board of my journal. And I have published many articles by Spanish researchers in my two journals. And I can say that I have published more papers by Spanish researchers in my journals, more papers than any other country except USA and China. So if you take into account the population, I can say I have published papers from Chinese, uh, from Spanish scholars more than any other country in the world. And that reflects on the quality of the research that Spanish researchers perform. And uh, I'm also a corresponding member of Spanish Royal Academy of Engineering. I have presented keynote lecture at five conferences in Spain since 2006. And I, I have served as honorary chair of many conferences. So you can see that I feel at home in Spain. And my, here is a list of my research contribution. I have contributed to uh, every computing research uh, in the last three, four decades. And especially to civil engineering, I have introduced a lot of new ideas for the first time. For example, I wrote the first article, journal article on application of neural network in civil engineering in 89, and I wrote the first book on parallel processing in structural engineering in 1993. So there's a whole list here, almost every computing area. And I have published in like 122 different journals in a wide variety of fields. So, but today I'm gonna to focus on machine learning, one of these topics. So here you see the, uh, on the top, the definition of uh, machine learning. Uh, machine learning algorithms simulate the way brain learns and solves an estimation recognition problem. And such an algorithm requires a learning phase to discover the patterns among the available data similar to the brain. So that is the traditional definition of machine learning. Then next you are gonna see my own definition of expanded definition of machine learning. Here I define a machine learning algorithm as an algorithm that can learn from examples and data and solve seemingly interactable learning or unteachable problems. And a problem that cannot be learned or taught is too complicated, we can use machine learning to solve uh, those problems. And I call, it, I call this ingenious AI, and you can also call it sometime scary AI, because in the future, somehow, uh, intelligent system and robots can maybe arguably take over the society. There are also some negative aspects of uh, artificial intelligence, but that's not the subject of my lecture today. So here you see the cover of uh, The Economist, 2017, and Data is the new oil. Data is very profitable. These companies, software companies from Google to Facebook, 
they're making billions of dollars using data, your data. You think you're getting free service from Facebook, but actually they're making a lot more money than the service they provide. So data is the new oil. So what do we do with this data? We have to extract information. That's where machine learning come into play. Machine learning is going to change the way you work and the way you live in the coming years. It's going to have an extraordinary impact on everything we do. So I'm going to uh, present some examples of machine learning. Most of my lecture is high level, but toward the end, I will go a little bit technical. So to give you a flavor of things that are involved in machine learning. So first, why should we be interested in machine learning? Here I have a list for you. Uh, one reason could be solve complex problems that previously were thought only a human could solve or even too difficult for human to solve. Another reason, as I already mentioned, mine a huge amount of data. It is referred to as big data sometimes, and also knowledge. You can use machine learning to make discoveries, like drug discoveries, and also create disruptive technologies. So what is machine learning? Machine learning means an algorithm. So we have to develop an algorithm. So what is an algorithm? What is an algorithm? What is the etymology of algorithm? And I would like to ask you a question, whether anybody knows in this room the etymology of algorithm. Anybody knows? Raise your hand. Etymology, so you know. Very good. You must be a mathematician. Are you a mathematician? No. So what is the etymology? What does an algorithm mean? Actually, there's a clue on the right. That comes from that guy's name. And that guy is called Al-Kharazmi. And he was a Persian mathematician. And uh, here you see the definition, not from me. This is from Encyclopedia Britannica, which is kind of a Bible. So the name algorithm comes from Al-Kharazmi, who is also known as the father of algebra. He wrote an algebra book was a textbook in Europe when he wrote it. So that's the, and also the, the definition of algorithm here you see, a systematic proce procedure that produces in a finite number of steps the answer to a question or the solution of a problem. So in machine learning we develop algorithms. So machine learning algorithms can be divided into three categories. One is the supervised learning, and uh, in this case, we need to have a number of examples. So we need to have example, we train the system, and then we can use to solve new problems. That's called supervised learning. Most learning algorithms are supervised learning. And the second one is unsupervised learning, and in this case, we find interesting pattern given a large amount of data. We don't have examples. Sometimes we don't have examples. We just have data. So we can use unsupervised learning. And the last one is called reinforcement learning. And here is uh, by making mistake. You learn by making mistake. And we provide a reward system. And that's the way actually you teach your dogs. That's the way you train your dogs. You reward him when he performs the act that you want. So these are three different kinds of machine learning algorithm. And here you see some uh, examples of application. I'm going to talk about a number of applications, but again, the three classes are unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And here you see some, some example. For example, uh, for uh, supervised learning, we can develop a fraud detection system or for unsupervised learning, we can develop a recommend recommendation system. And reinforced learning, we can use in robot navigation. OK. A few words about supervised learning. And an application is classification, in the example. How do you classify a sample test? 
I can tell you that to develop a machine learning algorithm, a powerful algorithm, the key is the feature extraction. Feature extraction is a key in developing a powerful machine learning algorithm. Here you see a couple of simple examples. Imagine we have trained using two classes. We say these are apples, these are oranges, and now we have a new object. This is a new object. Is it an apple or an orange? So if you use the color, this will be classified as an orange, which is wrong. If we use the shape, it will be classified as an apple. So feature extraction is a key in developing a powerful machine learning algorithm. I'll come back to this toward the end of my lecture. So here you see uh, uh, two different kinds of supervised learning. In the classification algorithm, the output here is integer. For example, you can develop a, an algorithm to tell you whether your email is a spam or not a spam. Yes or no, a spam or not a spam. So only two cases. On the other hand, regression algorithm, the, like, like for example, you want to estimate the price of a house, that's a real number, that's not an integer number, and that is called regression algorithm. And here you see another example of a classification algorithm uh, to determine whether uh, uh, the face uh, is that animal or, uh, uh, or not, uh, or muffin. Is, is it a muffin or this animal? And another example of supervised learning here is, uh, you see, for example, we can use these examples to teach our system that these are all alls, and then you give a new uh, figure like this, and the system should determine whether this is an all or not. This is an example of supervised learning. And another example is number recognition, hand writing number recognition. Handwriting recognition is very complicated because every person write, the, write differently. Like, for example, here you see something like a couple of different hundred types of eights. So we, tell, we teach a system, we use this as a training set, and then a new person writes an eight, and the system is able to determine whether that's an eight or not. So in, since 2014, a particular kind of uh, machine learning called deep learning has become very popular. Everybody is using, it seems that using machine learning, deep machine learning. So what is a deep machine learning? That refers to the number of hidden layers. So usually in a neural network, we have input layer and output layer and a, num a number of hidden layers. So uh, to be a deep learning neural network, we need at least three three hidden layers. And in the case of Google Net, Google also uh, has used uh, machine learning to, uh, deep machine learning to develop Google Net. It has 22 uh, hidden layers. And in 2014, Google Net became very famous because there was a competition, competition for image recognition, and uh, Google Net was the winner in terms of making the recognition the most accurately in 2014. So, I'm going to now present a number of interesting, or you can say cool, examples of machine learning in real life and the companies, which companies are using machine learning. So here an example is driverless cars. So, you need to use machine learning to develop driverless cars. Uh, another example is automating repetitive work, like the work of a radiologist. The, a radiologist's work is very, very repetitive. He sits in front of the screen and reads eight hours per day. It's very repetitive. So we can automate this using machine learning. So for example, for diagnosis of lung, Lung cancer, lung cancer kills, this is only in the US, 154,000 uh, 
patients every year. And compare it with the breast cancer is about 41,000 and prostate cancer 29. And lung cancer is a killer. Kills very fast, within a few months, unless if you detect it very early. And early detection is not easy. Even for radiologists, it's not easy. So we can use machine learning in order to detect this in earlier stage. So here is, uh, on the left top here, you see a traditional way, for example, we have different imaging modalities here, it's CT and PET, so radiologists can read them and make the diagnosis of whether uh, there is lung cancer or not. And this can be automated, and the stages are feature extraction and using machine learning classification, and then finally, complete diagnosis. At least in one case, it has been shown that five times better diagnosis can be made using this automated system compared with a trained radiologist. Okay, that was example by someone else. Here I want to go show you an example by my group. So epilepsy. Anybody in this room know someone with an epilepsy? Can you please raise your hand? You, do, you, have, you know someone, okay. So epilepsy actually is a very common disease. It doesn't get a lot of attention like Alzheimer's or heart disease, but it's very common. And uh, so how is the diagnosis made? You can go to a neurologist. Better than that, you go to an epileptologist. A neurologist has four years of training after medical school, and that's not enough. You have another one or two years of training, you become epileptologist. Like, uh, uh, so, so then you can, the job of an epileptologist is to read EEGs. You know, this is a room, EEG room, so you keep EEGs. So an, an, an epileptologist can order a 30 minute EEG, usually 30 minute EEG. So you sit under the EEG machine and they record your brain waves for 30 minutes. So there are pages and pages of signals and if epileptologist goes through this and detect whether you have epilepsy or not. So, and actually I started this research in early 2000 and I was inspired by this lady here on the left and this is picture 2002 beginning of my research in this area of uh, computational neuroscience, and she is my uh, first PhD student in this area. And so this lady is also the source of my inspiration and happens to be my wife, and she is sitting over there. Her name is Nahi Dodmer. So inspiration comes from her. Without her being her husband, I would have never done this research, really. So uh, in this person is an epileptologist and happens to be my son. So his job is to read those EEGs for 20 hours per week, okay? And I ask him the question, can you find abnormality? How accurately, etc.? And this is from him. I mean, at Delhi, abnormality yield of a standard 30 minute EEG is 30 to 50%. We can do better than that. So when they cannot make a diagnosis, then they order an overnight EEG. So the, and the patient goes to hospital, it stays there for 24 hours. So 24 hours of EEGs. And, uh, and again, the epileptologist has to go through all this and to see whether the person has epilepsy. So we have automated this. We have automated this. And on the top, what you see is my very first paper. We developed a model that would detect absence seizure. Here, absence seizure, usually children get absence seizure, one kind of seizure, and they have this kind of look. So actually, this is relatively easy to diagnose. So we started with easy, I mean for neurologists to diagnose. So absence seizure, they can make diagnosis relatively easily. So that was my first paper. Actually, this started the entire field of automated EEG-based diagnosis of neurological disorders. And this paper has become a seminal paper, has been cited 975 times. So we automated that. So here we use 
machine learning, but also not just, just machine learning, but also advanced signal processing techniques, but also chaos theory. But machine learning is a big component of that. So after that, we developed a model for automated diagnosis of other more complicated epilepsies where epileptologists cannot make the diagnosis. So that's not the subject of my research today. I'm giving you examples of machine learning. If you're interested, anybody interested, you can read this book here, Automated EEG-Based Diagnosis of Neurological Disorders, Inventing the Future of Neurology. So my goal became to invent the future of neurology. And this was done in, published in 2010. And I am sad to report to you, the future hasn't arrived yet. That's not the way neurology is practiced today. So here, what is the machine learning issue? Machine learning issue is it's a classification problem. You have to decide, the epileptologist or our system, whether the person is healthy or the EEG is interictal or ictal. Ictal is a medical term that means during seizure. During seizure. And interictal means between two seizures. You may not have seizure every day. You may have once every month. So it's a classification problem. So we use machine learning to define three classes. And here's another example of machine learning. You connect an otoscope to your iPhone. Take a picture and send it remotely to an automated system and to see whether your baby has ear infection or not. You see the baby is crying. Now why is she crying? One reason could be ear infection. It's very common. So machine learning can automate this and will tell you whether the baby has ear infection so you don't have to rush to the emergency room or to the hospital. So that's another example. When I was preparing this lecture, I prepared this lecture recently. So here is the proof that I prepared the lecture recently. It's May 15, 2019. I was working on this lecture, and I came up with this story. And this is in a, a shot health news from NPR. NPR is National Public Radio. And they have a website. They call it Shot Health News website. And I read this article. So a group at the University of Washington, Seattle, uh, they developed this system. They connect this funnel, and uh, you can connect it to your iPhone, and you can pick up the echo of the sound, and then have an application to analyze it, and an algorithm on the phone figures it out uh, almost immediately. What's the algorithm? That's the machine learning algorithm. So that's another one. And come back to my own research, we developed this model for computer-aided diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So uh, if anybody uh, has potentially Parkinson's disease, then you go to another person, another specialist called movement disorder specialist. You don't go to epileptologist. You go to that guy who has four years of neurology plus one or two more years of additional training becomes a movement disorder especially. We, de we develop a model where for automated diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And neurological disorders are very complicated. Diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is not easy because the symptoms are similar to 20 other. I don't want you to read this. I don't expect you to read the right on the right. I just want to tell you that there are 20 other diseases with similar symptoms. So it's not easy to make diagnosis. And also, uh, neurologists don't order EEGs. By reading, you can only learn so much. We go inside the EEG. We model inside. We, we take a mathematical microscope and see what is inside the EEG. So we developed this model. And for uh, differentiating between two disorders, one is uh, Parkinson's disease, and uh, the other one is known as SWED, and, uh, which is an abbreviation you see on the top. And we use different machine learning algorithms. These are the first three, four, first four are popular machine learning algorithms. And this is probabilistic neural network, and this is the 
the enhanced probability neural network developed by my group, and here you get the maximum accuracy. Look at the accuracy number, 92%, 98%, etc. So we can do much better. So here is a summary of computer-aided diagnosis of Parkinsonism. Let's go to another example. Actually, when I was inspired by my wife to do this research, I wanted to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. That was my first interest, because she's the kind of person who talks about work at dinner. Oh, today I had this patient with Alzheimer's disease, and it is so devastating, and we cannot make the diagnosis early. If we make early, maybe we can use medicine, but when it is late, nothing can be done. So I said, I want to look at their brain and see what's going on. By that, I mean brain waves, not brain physically. So, but in 2002, there was absolutely no data, EEG data, on for Alzheimer's disease. Why? Because neurologists do not see anything in EEGs of Alzheimer's patients, especially in earlier stage. So later on, I moved, I developed models for automated diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, here you see a summary of my research. I wrote my first paper in 2008. That may be the very first paper on automated EEG-based diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. That's a huge problem. Remember my definition of machine learning? We want to solve problems that nobody can solve. They are not teachable. You cannot learn. So this is one of them. And my latest paper, and by the way, in this, you see two Adelis. H. Adeli, that's me, Hoja Adeli, and there's another one. A. Adeli is Anna Adeli, and this is Anna Adeli, and that's Amin Adeli's twin. And she's a, why do I have her picture? Anybody has Alzheimer's, knows anybody with Alzheimer's disease? Raise your hand. No one? That's amazing. Oh, you have? No one. No one. That's amazing because the number of Alzheimer's patients increasing every year. So nobody has no someone with Alzheimer's disease. Okay. You have someone. So you go, you see a neurologist. You have a neurologist. Maybe you don't know. The patient is, patient is far from you, right? So you can see a neurologist, but actually you should see a subspecialist. It's called cognitive neurologist. So don't go to a regular neurologist, go to a cognitive neurologist, and that's why you see Anna's picture there. She is a cognitive neurologist. So, and these neurologists check my work, make sure my neurology is correct. By the way, brain is our family hobby. We talk about brain all the time. So my lat latest, I also have collaboration. For this kind of research, you need data. So last one, I have collaboration with a group in, in Italy. And those guys are collecting longitudinal data over years, five years, 10 years. Extremely difficult to get. In the United States, it's almost impossible, very, very difficult. And I don't have the time or patience to collect data. I am a computation model. So I collaborate with them, they have data, and we develop, this is my latest paper, published just a few weeks ago. Automated differential diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, that's one disorder, and Alzheimer's disease. That's the latest. Another example of machine learning. And we have also developed automated diagnosis of other neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders, like autism and ADHD, and even major depressive disorder. So, then my ultimate goal is to develop, this is actually the first page of another lecture somewhere else. And you see the bottom here in Washington at the Biomedical Engineering Conference with 500 people. But what I want to say here, you see towards a unified theory of brain for automated EEG-based diagnosis of neurological and psychiatric disorders. What is the dream research? Dream is one day in the future, not too far in the future, maybe the next few years or a decade, we get one EEG record for 30 minutes, then I can examine your brain, tell you what is wrong with you. You have epilepsy, you have Parkinson's disease, and you have Alzheimer's disease, you have major depressive disorder, everything. And we're getting to that point. So that's my dream. Now let's move on. Brain is not, I say brain is my hobby, but I also work on the heart. 
And my work is mostly almost all computation. I'm a computation modeler. But here, I had a PhD student who was very bright. His name is Sankari, Zia Sankari. He was a hardware person. So I put his hardware expertise with my computation modeler and created a gadget. And we call it a heart saver. We, we, we invented heart saver for detection of abnormalities of the heart. So a gadget, you connect it to the, your heart and measure your heartbeats, and we can detect what is wrong with your heart and send a signal to your cardiologist, and, and he can also verify what we are doing. So this is the future of the medicine. And we did that in 2000, 2010. This was published 2011, and I submitted, a, I disclosed invention to my university, and we have an office for this kind of thing, and I asked them uh, you know, to apply for a patent, and they tell me it costs about $20,000 to apply for a patent, and they refused to apply because the university didn't want to pay $20,000. And I asked why, they said, oh, there's a company called Medtronic. Medtronic is a huge medical device company. They are doing the same thing. Okay, I said, okay, I'm gonna go home and do my homework. So I went to their website and see what Medtronic doing here. That was 2011, 2010. And I ran only one line. We are developing such a device. There was nothing like that. So this is the first of its kind. So my university was not willing to spend $20,000 to, to apply for a patent. So this is a new invention that was published then. So the student has also an interesting story. And he was from Lebanon. He was very bright. He came on a Fulbright scholar for scholarship. And you probably know Fulbright scholarship is extremely difficult. You have to be really the best. So I can say he came from Lebanon. He was the best engineering graduate of the year from Lebanon. He was very bright. So that's why I challenged him. You know, I gave a, I usually choose the topic of PhD depending on the talent of my PhD student. So I challenged him and he created this. Then his story is, he was a PhD student, he wanted to see his parents, he had a J1 visa. And I knew if you, with a J1 visa, if you go back, you can't come back to the United States for two years. He didn't listen to me, he said, no, I'm gonna come back. He was stuck. Okay, so he never finished his PhD. But guess what happened? That made him a millionaire. Because he couldn't come back to finish his PhD, he started the company. And now, uh, this is the gadget we created. So, I have a lot of other materials to say. And the cost of this was less than $100. What we developed was for less than $100. So, he's a millionaire and he's very famous now. More famous than his advisor. Because he met President Obama. I've never met President Obama. As an entrepreneur of the year, he got an award from uh, President Obama. And he's a millionaire. And then a few years later, he stopped by to say hi to me. I said, do you want to come back and finish your PhD? He said, no way. I'm making millions per year. So PhD was gone. No, he was like you know, the other guy, Bill Gates and dropout, but at PhD level, not undergraduate level. So in the left one is from his website. Now he has a company called Cardio Diagnostics, and he's developing actually similar things. But He's, he's a millionaire. He has offices in different countries, United States, uh, Lebanon, and Dubai, and different places. So that was that. And as I said, my research is not only brain. Brain is the most interesting part for me because it's so complicated. It's really amazing the way the brain works. And the more you learn, and the more interesting it becomes. But I have also worked in the area of ophthalmology. So here we develop, this is a more recent paper. We develop a model, a model for automated detection of glaucoma. And for glaucoma, it's, I think, the second cause of death. Glaucoma is the second cause of death. And so for that, you go to an ophthalmologist. So I'm playing ophthalmology. And, I, and for that, you go to an ophthalmologist like Mona Adeli. And I kid, I kid with my, I joke with my kids. I say, I'm going to put you out of business all of you, you are gonna lose your job. 
So let's look at some other application of machine learning. Uh, that companies, major companies are pursuing. It's not just research lab or my researchers like me are doing. When companies get involved, that means the field has matured. It is it being commercialized. So let's see IBM Watson. Have you heard of IBM Watson? IBM Watson, uh, developed by IBM, a system aimed to see, hear, read, talk, Taste, interpret, learn, and recommend. Superman. So IBM Watson is really a Superman. He can do the things that no person can do. He is really a Superman. But for that, Superman, you need massively parallel computing. Supercomputing has supercomputer, and that's the description of the supercomputer. So IBM Watson is working on retina specialists, and they have 88,000 retina images and ophthalmologists during her entire life. I don't think she will see 88,000 retina images. So you can see why this machine learning is going to change. It's a game changer. So another application is chatbot or conversational agent. I'm sure all of you knowingly or unknowingly have used chatbots, interacted with chatbots. Actually, I was on the internet and had some difficulty with my phone line and, and I had to ask some questions and, and, and the, the chatbot was very helpful. So I decided to ask the question, are you a robot? And chatbot responded, I'm not. And I think he was lying. <laughs> so. Chatbots will be increasingly smarter and more responsive and better at their job in the coming year rather than customer service. Usually you call and somebody customer service, you have to wait 10, 15 minutes and somebody helps you and he cannot, he doesn't know how to help you and then you go to her boss and then the boss's boss. So that can be automated using machine learning. Some other innovative application of chatbots and you have heard of Facebook chatbot army. There's an army of chatbot to collect data from you and sell data and make billions. But also a Russian company, this is very interesting, by the name of Endurance and created a companion for dementia patients. If you have a relative who has dementia, your life is really tough. Life is really tough. So this robot can work as a companion for the dementia patient. And here you see some other example. News, NBC uses a chatbot to help uh, navigate through health headlines. Yelp uh, is a crowdsource review form and they use machine learning to compile, categorize, and label tens of millions of photo images of restaurants more efficiently. Pinterest uses machine learning to improve content discovery and make more money, advertising monetization. What is the most money? And Google has something called DeepMind that uses deep machine learning. And these psychedelic images have been drawn by computer, not by human. So you can have artists, computers that are artists can create pieces of art that never existed before. Baidu, Chinese company, creating deep voice. And this system can learn the unique subtleties in the cadence, accent, pronunciation, and pitch to create highly accurate recreation of a speaker's voices. We have some ladies here. Some of you are fashionable. Have you heard of Marchesa? Raise your hand, Marchesa. Never heard? Me either. But I hear it's a high-end fashion house. It's a high-end fashion house. So this is a smart dress. And so Marches and IBM Watson, they got together and created this dress. And tweets were passed through a Watson tone analyzer and then sent back to the small computer inside the waist of the dress. And the color changes based on the mood of the audience. 
and that is done by machine learning. So an application here, and you know, in Mars rover, Mars <coughs> rover, you collect lots of data. What do you do? What data is good? So you can use machine learning. And I want to show you an example which is even more complicated. You may think that this is the data obtained from Mars rover is complicated. Not really. That's relatively easy. What is complicated is this. We have solved a problem that cannot be solved by human. Can you predict the price of housing next year? Can anybody in Spain predict the price of housing next year? If somebody says he can predict, don't believe him. It's, it's not possible. Some people predict, predict crashes. You see, when the house, when there is bubble in the housing market, then there's a high probability of a recession. Can you predict the next recession? Like in the United States, we have had expansion for the last 10 years, so this recession is coming. Is it next year, the year after, the year after? And to a big extent, it depends on the housing market. So can you predict? Once every while, somebody comes to TV and say, oh, there's going to be a recession next year. And some of them get lucky, because eventually there's going to be a recession, right? So we develop a model to predict the housing price. This is a very complicated problem. Why is this complicated? Look at the left. On the left, you see a list of physical and financial properties. We only look at residential condos. In this particular research, residential condos. So on the left, you see these properties affect the price. On the right, you see economic factors. There are so many factors. That's why I'm saying no human being is capable of predicting the price of housing. It's impossible. But we develop a model that can do that using machine learning. And we use data from this city to verify our model. So I'm just giving you an example of machine learning. If you're interested, you can read in this paper. This paper was published in 2016. You can read it there. But we verified data obtained from this city. You know this city? What is this city? Anybody knows? Wow, you must see from that city. Yeah. You are? So you cheated. OK. Usually nobody knows. This is Tehran. So that student was from Iran, and he collected. He went to offices, really, physically, and collected that. It was not easy to collect that, and we verified the model. So I showed you examples so far. It was all high level. So I may get a little bit technical, but not too technical. So, so far, I showed you examples. Well, my research group has made fundamental contributions to machine learning, which is about developing algorithms. And these algorithms are mathematical algorithms, mathematical concepts. So here you see five of my papers. The first one, 1994. We developed a brand new machine learning algorithm then. But I want you to pay attention to the three-color one. So, uh, and it's like the, the blue, we develop enhanced probabilistic neural network with local decision circles. And, and then this one, which is recent, so I want to spend a few minutes on this one. A new neural dynamic classification algorithm, brand new. We started from zero. Because again, I had the opportunity to work with a bright PhD student. And you know, I mentioned that Fulbright uh, student. Do you know that a student could go to any university in the United States? If you have Fulbright, you can pick your university. You can go to Harvard, MIT, Stanford, your guaranteed admission. And he chose me. He didn't choose a university. He chose a faculty member because he had read my work and he was inspired. So the ability to attack this kind of a student is simply priceless from my perspective, because you can push them. You cannot push every student. They go crazy if they don't have the capacity. So here was another you know, crazy student just like me. So I said, we are going to start a brand new machine learning algorithm. Forget what else. Deep learning is so popular. Everybody is using deep learning. So we developed this brand new a neural dynamic classification algorithm publishing IEEE transaction neural network and learning system in December of 2017. So I'm going to mention 
I'm going to say a few words about that if I am allowed. And also, uh, you can stop me if I am going over my time. Please feel free. Uh, how many more minutes do I have? Or no problem. No problem. Okay, I will continue. But feel free to stop me. So I'm going to talk about this new algorithm a little bit, so you can see that uh, how interesting it can be. Before, so I gave this PhD student certain ideas, and then he went. Before I can talk about that algorithm, I want to talk about something else. And that something else is a patented algorithm. I've written a lot of papers, but I only have one algorithm, patented. I only have one patent. I mean, I said I have one, one algorithm, I misspoke. I meant I have one patented algorithm. I only have one patent. And that patent is this a neural dynamic optimization model, uh, and this is known as neural dynamic optimization model of Adele and Park. Park is a former PhD student, another bright PhD student, who is now a professor at Yonsei University in Korea. So we develop, again, we started from scratch at that time. It's a one develop, an algorithm that is particularly powerful with large scale, large scale optimization problem without having any kind of a stability issue, convergence issue, et cetera. And so the key idea is, you know, we discussed any optimization problem can be modeled as a dynamic system where the optimum solution is the equilibrium point. And then we use four mathematical concepts. We use the concept of neural dynamic to direct the evolution of the solution. We use the Aponov stability theorem to ensure continuously decreasing convergence. We use penalty function method to reduce violation of constraint, and we use the Kuhn-Tucker condition to guarantee optimality. And of course, I'm not gonna go into detail of this. This is uh, the basic dynamic system, and on the bottom you see the Lyapunov stability theorem application there. So, let's see here. So, if you are interested in this, there's a whole book. To learn that algorithm, you have to read a whole book. The book is called Neurocomputing for Design Automation, published in 1998. And we got the pattern in 1998. But I want to show you an example. We applied that for optimization of a super high-rise building, 144-story building with more than 20,000 members. That time, at that time, this was the tallest building ever designed. So you can see the detail in that. And here you see the beautiful convergence curve. You know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. These are beautiful curves. Why? Because each time the value goes down. If you are working in the area of optimization, this is large scale. We are not talking about a small academic optimization exercise. This is large scale. We have 20,000 members. We have in like 500 variables, we have 30,000 constraints, very large scale. So each time it goes down, that's the beauty of the algorithm. That's why I decided to apply for a patent. And by the way, why I don't have more patent, one reason may be the cost, which costs 20,000, but the other one is philosophical. I share my knowledge with people. So that algorithm, by the, by the way, is not known by anyone, very few people. But it's patented. You cannot use it. You are not allowed to use it. Patent prevents distribution. And I share my knowledge, so philosophically, I don't apply for patent in general. So we applied this to this uh, problem of to automate uh, not only the whole design of the whole thing, but also find the minimum weight, the lightest structure. So imagine you just define the loading and the geometry. An hour later, you have the design of the whole thing. And of course, this had to be done on a supercomputer. We use connection machine, highly parallel connection machine. I challenge you. The technology that we developed 20 years ago, no commercial software today has that. If there's any structural engineer, civil engineer, I want you guys to be challenged, find. So the technology we develop is still is not commercialized. 
Anyway, so that was that. Then coming back to machine learning, so a new you neural know, dynamic classification algorithm, you will see the connection between this and the previous one in a minute. So we we'll start with some ideas, and then the PhD student work on the ideas for three years and make sure it works. So what's the idea? Probability of a new data point being classified correctly is increased if the existing data points are transformed into a new feature space with large margins between clusters and close proximity of the classmates. That long sentence is a very important key idea. So and the goal was to develop a supervised neural dynamic classification algorithm with higher accuracy than other existing and frequently used classification algorithms. We said we can do better than anyone else. That was the goal. Did we achieve it? I'll show you some results. So let me show you some example. A complicated problem have many dimensions, 10, 20 dimensions. We cannot visualize in more than two or three dimensions. So here I have a simple example of three dimensions. Imagine we have three classes, red, blue, green. So how do we separate them? Well, in this space, they are not separable. So the idea here is to change the feature space. You know what are the features? The apple has the color and the shape. But for complicated problem, features don't have physical meaning. In my EEG work, features have no physical meaning. But there are still features. So the features here, and we have three classes, you cannot separate them. But if we transform them to some ideal world, transform to some ideal world, where we can separate them like this, then we can classify them. This is one class, another class, another class. That's the idea. Can it be done? And after three years, the answer is yes. So we define a transformation function to generate a new J dimensional feature space. Probability of the transformed form of X, the original input, which is Z now, in the new feature space is Z, and that's a J dimensional row vector being correctly classified should, should be original is like this and transform like this. So basically, we transform the feature space such that the probability of a more accurate classification is increased. So here is the proposition. So Z is the resultant of M transform form of X. M is the number of classes. And we put them all uh, side by side, column wise. And we call this feature vector representative form of x. And then we define a transformation um, a function. Here it is linear, but we can also use nonlinear function. So b here is a j-dimensional row vector of biases, and o is a j-dimensional column vector of ones for consistency. So here is the idea is we transform so that transformation function generate well marginalized, the D is missing here, feature spaces. These feature spaces should lead to a well marginalized feature space where Z total belongs to. And how to find WM and BM? These are coefficients. We call them transformation parameters. How do you find them? We use them, we use the null dynamic optimization model. So we defined a minimization problem, an objective function with three sets of constraints solved m times. Objective function is to reduce the total Euclidean distance between classes constrained to marginalize non-classmates. So this is our objective function. And these are the inequality constraints. So you can see that this G1 pushes training data points in class M into a hybrid sphere with radius Rm, and G, G2 pushes training data point in classes other than M out of the hypersphere. Some more equations. 
I think we have seen enough equations. That's enough. So let's do some, some examples. So the first thing we did, we applied this to some benchmark, so-called benchmark. If you're doing research in machine learning, some people have created benchmark problems, and uh, you can use them to see whether your algorithm is better than someone else's. So these benchmark problems are known as glass, iris, uh, seed, sonar, wine, etc. Like wine is, how do we classify different kinds of wine? So I'm not going to describe each one. So here you see the number of data points, number of features. Like a wine has 13 different features, okay? Like color, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, number of classes, three, and number of variables to be optimized here, you see. The larger this number, the larger this number, the more complicated the learning process. So these are benchmark problems. And here I want to show you the beauty of the new, the new algorithm. Look at the convergence curve. It is so smooth. So smooth. This is the beauty of this algorithm. And here you see some results. Of course, there are 100 numbers here. I don't want you to read 100 numbers, but I'm going to summarize for you. The summary here is we compared our new algorithm and with uh, several other uh, machine learning algorithms. And like, for example, here, S stands for support vector machine, another machine learning algorithm. And uh, P stands for probabilistic signal network. E it stands for Enhanced Probability Signal Network, which is ours. So, uh, and the last column is the new algorithm. So you can see that our results consistently are the, the best, most accurate. And after this, we decide to apply this to a more complicated problem, which is hand recognition. Hand recognition is a complicated problem. Let me give you an example. My wife often gives me a shopping list. I go shopping, and I cannot read some of them. And this happens often. So I don't have the intelligence to read her handwriting. That's how complicated it is. My intelligence is not enough. So this is a complicated problem. There is also a, this is all, there is also a benchmark problem for this. So actually, there are 60,000 training examples of these numbers. Each number written by a different person. By a different person. So 60,000. There's also 10,000 for testing. So these are available. So the problem is huge. Look, we have 20,000 variables to be optimized. We have 100,000 constraints. Requires standardization. This could be done only on a supercomputer. And by the way, one of the reasons machine learning has taken over or taking over is because we're having more and more powerful computers. Machine learning algorithms are very intensive computationally. There is a price to be paid. And uh, so that's the price. And by having more and more powerful computers, we can do more machine learning. In this particular case, we had to use the supercomputer at Ohio State University, but uh, we got the results. So here. The result here, PNN 65%, EPNN 65%, our algorithm 88%. You're not impressed, huh? You think that's not good enough? I can read my wife's handwriting more than 88%. My accuracy is maybe 60, 70%. So uh, this is what it is. So this is 88% is very good for this problem. Then uh, let's go on now to. Uh, OK, let's just let's skip this. Some problems that arguably cannot be solved. So some application of this you know, dynamic classification, the brand new. So as I said, that algorithm is brand new. We didn't take someone else's idea and tinker with it. Okay, So we started from scratch. And now we're going to apply this to some problem that arguably cannot be solved. I understand there are some civil engineers here, right? Can you raise your hand if you are a civil engineer or a structural engineer? Is there a structural engineer here? OK, very good. Thank you. So earthquake prediction is one of those that cannot be solved. You can argue that it's too complicated. Okay? 
and we solved it. We developed a model. And uh, so the idea is to develop earthquake warning system. So we develop an earthquake warning system. So right now, actually, in the US, there are some versions of early warning system, but warning is based on P waves and S waves. You have one minute, two minutes, three minutes. That's what you have. In our model, you get two weeks warning in advance, one week warning in advance. So that's, that's the difference. So uh, here, uh, we use seismicity indicators, and I will show them in the next slide, not P waves. So, and indicators are computed using the earthquake magnitude temporal distribution before an event. So this model uses this uh, normal dynamic classification algorithm to forecast the occurrence of a magnitude range. So we only uh, predict magnitude range from five to five and a half, from six to six and a half, something like that. But also it uses the neural dynamic optimization model of Adelian Park to forecast the location. We also forecast the location of the major earthquake. So again, if you're interested in this research, this was published just last year, I mean, almost a year ago, 2017. So you can read there. So these are our seismicity indicators. You see there's so many different parameters. So that's why it's, it's not easy to predict earthquake. So, and here is our model. So we perform a sensitivity analysis to find the best combination of seismic indicators for the most accurate prediction. And we present it as a minimization problem. And on the right, you see the network uh, architecture. So some equations here for you. So let's skip those. And we apply this to Southern California, where there are data. You have to have data. In this model, you have to have data. And we use data. And we were able, actually, so has been verified using the data from the Southern California. So actually, and here is the conclusion. The model was able to predict the time magnitude and location of a future earthquake, which happened after the last event in the repository. We were able to predict a magnitude five, between five and five and a half uh, in a particular area. Can we predict an earthquake of magnitude seven or eight? That is become more difficult because we don't have data. We don't have data. There are not so many magnitude seven earthquakes. See, this model depends on data. So in the future, as we get more data, the system becomes more intelligent. And here is my final example. Okay, my final example. Is a field called a structural health monitoring. And it's a relatively new field. So uh, like during wind or earthquake, the structures get damaged. Can we see whether there's damage in the earthquake, in the building, like bridge or building? So it's a, one of those problems that uh, arguably cannot be solved. Some people say, no, you cannot do that. And let me give you an example. Uh, during an earthquake uh, of magnitude around, uh, I think it was about less than seven, in Los Angeles, and some still high-rise buildings were damaged, but nobody knew. And it was discovered by accident. And for the first time, we read, everybody, engineer read on the first page of Los Angeles Times. How? Because in one building, some uh, people wanted to do uh, some uh, plumbing work, electric work. So they remove, usually, you know, buildings are have, have cladding, like, you know, this column there has cladding, so you cannot see the column itself. So they had to open the wall and, you know, do some plumbing and electrical work. And they observed cracks at the connection of this high-rise steel buildings. And nobody knew about it. 
Okay. So the technology we have created, the idea is uh, we look at the signals. Buildings vibrate during wind, ambient vibration, earthquake. We collect signals, we collect signals, and we tell you whether the building is healthy or damaged. Now you see the connection between my civil engineering research and brain research. In brain research, we look at signals and see whether the brain is damaged, and we do the same here. So here we develop a model to detect damage in high-rise building structures, and this was published in 2017. And what do we do? Imagine you have a high-rise building. We place sensors. You cannot put thousands of sensors. So we place sensors, three sensors on every 10 floors. Three sensors on every 10 floors, and we collect data. Okay, data during wind, or if there's an earthquake, earthquake, after the earthquake. So then we look at the signals, signals, and try to analyze the signal and see whether the structure is healthy or not. And this is like similar to EKG or ECG. Uh, when you have a problem with your heart, you go and see a cardiologist. The first thing he does, order an ECG. And then he sees whether the heart is normal or not. But usually ECG doesn't tell you exactly what is wrong with your heart. It just tells you there's something wrong with your heart. And that's what we have created. So we develop the overall, we can determine the overall health of the uh, structure. If you remember, a number of years ago, there was a bridge that collapsed in Minneapolis, United States. A bridge suddenly collapsed. Okay? And some hundred people died, if you remember. And so bridges are inspected in the United States, in Spain too, periodically. So before then, until that time, in the United States, the rule was every two years, somebody would go physically to the bridge, under the bridge, above the bridge, look around for cracks, write a report every two years. And after that bridge, now they do it every year. But what happens during this one year? If something goes wrong with the bridge, you wouldn't know. So the technology we have created would monitor the bridge continuously, continuously. But here is a challenge. You have these sensors, you're collecting data 24 hours per day, seven days per week, 52 weeks per year, year after year, and the bridge is healthy most of the time, right? So what do you have? You have huge, huge amount of data that's why here is the analogy. There is a needle in the haystack. So you have to find a needle. We try to find the needle in the haystack. So that's one of those problems that arguably cannot be solved, and we have solved it using machine learning and also advanced signal processing techniques. So problems. To extract meaningful features using vibration-based health monitoring of structures. And, and for that, we use machine learning for feature extraction and then also classification. So challenges. Sensor, uh, in terms of implementation, you can only place a limited number of them because they cost money. And the uh, optimum number of sensors is a question and also proper location. So as I said, in our particular model, we place sensors every 10th floor and three sensors on every 10th floor. And by the way, I should explain this figure. You know, nowadays, more and more there's international collaboration. These boundaries of the countries is being broken. While our politicians are becoming more and more right wing or left wing, but there's more and more collaboration. So I have collaboration with this uh, researcher in uh, Korea. And this is called uh, Latte Tower, the tallest building in uh, Seoul, in Korea, 123 stories. And it was, it was opened just about two years ago. So I have a collaboration with him. He has placed sensors on the floors of this building. And you know, I went to visit him, so this is when we took a picture. It was under construction. So he collected data and we tested our model using his data. And of course, the building is not damaged, so we cannot verify the damage part. 
but we can verify in terms of change of properties or estimating properties of the building. So we can verify. So that's why that picture is there. And that's the research collaboration with a Korean. And I have 10 different research collaborations. I have had research collaboration with the Spanish uh, researchers, but not at this moment. So more and more this is happening. So you know, I hope there will be opportunities, maybe after this presentation, if you're interested, we can talk about research collaboration. Uh, you know, like in my Alzheimer research, I mentioned I have collaborators in Italy. They collect data and I provide computational expertise. So here we are. So here is the model. Our machine learning based algorithm to detect damage in high rise buildings. So we have M is the number of healthy states. And then here we use different ideas. It's not just the machine learning. We also use a synchro squeeze wavelet transform uh, to perform uh, signal denoising. That's important step. And then uh, uh, we use also RVM, which is a unsupervised learning restricted Boltzmann machine. And then finally, we use uh, NDC, our own uh, neural dynamic classification algorithm. So for complicated problem, I say you have to have a multi-paradigm approach to solution. One way, one method is not enough. You have to have a multi-paradigm. Here you see that we use a combination. Even we use here Fourier transform. Fourier term. We, we combine Fourier transform with wavelet transform. So let's just. Uh, skip the details, and we test it. In this model, we need training examples. So how do you know, how do you create training examples? One, mod one way is to create a, a scaled model of the structure and test it on the shake table. So actually, someone has done this for this building. There is this 38 story, this is a scaled model, a 128 scaled model of an actual 38-story reinforced concrete building structure in Hong Kong. And this is the, I, this, that the Professor Ni in Hong Kong Polytechnic provides data. And we tested our model using his data on 120th scale model of 38-story building. So here, we have to define damage states and uh, light, moderate, severe, near collapse. So in our model, we can tell you the damage state. Okay, we determine this is like EKG, whether you, are, you have a heart problem or not problem, without telling you what exactly the damage is. And this is important. Here there are samples, uh, training data. Each column corresponds to a floor. And then uh, uh, rows, this is healthy, light damage, moderate damage, severe damage, near collapse. All these data are from shake table experimental studies. So uh, here is some results. Uh, we used uh, four values for M. M is the number of classes. If you look at the bottom, for example, we can have five classes, healthy, light, moderate, severe, and near collapse. Or you can combine some of them have uh, four classes or three classes, so we tested different combinations. And again, uh, uh, there are lots of numbers, but I will tell you where to look. Look at these red numbers, and these are, uh, this is uh, K-nearest neighbor, a well-known class classification algorithm. This is another well-known probabilistic neural network. This is enhanced probabilistic neural network, and this is a new uh, our new model, neural dynamic classification algorithm, and the best results are here. And again, keep in mind, this is a very complicated learning problem. And this goes back to definition, my expanded definition of machine learning. So here is a summary. So I mentioned my approach is multi-paradigm through adroit combination of two signal processing techniques, 
SWT and FFT, and an unsupervised machine learning, and also a classification algorithm. Now, the model can be used for other application, uh, medical application. We have used this model for medical application. I'm not going to talk about that. Medical application, I'm going to just say briefly what it is. Uh, physical rehabilitation. If you have a stroke, you go for physical rehabilitation, right? Uh, what do they do? They tell you, they give you a set of instruction, have this mo motion or that motion, or play game. Now game playing is a way of uh, physical rehabilitation. And usually uh, that physical therapist uh, prints out the sheet and gives the same thing to every, every patient. So we're gonna change this, we're gonna make this personalized. So we are looking at the data, we collect data and then try to personalize, depending which motions and which action can improve a particular person's uh, problem. And we have used this, uh, and I actually have written also a paper in this area. I think this is a good point to stop because the rest goes into how to improve machine learning. I think this is a good uh, point to stop. And I think I've talked more than an hour, right? My time is over. Professor Adeli. Buenos días de nuevo a todos. Vicerrector de Servicios Tecnológicos de la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, Secretaria General de la Universidad, Vicerrector Adjunta para Planificación Académica e Internacionalización, Vicerrector Adjunto para Doctorado y Apoyo a la Investigación, Profesor Adeli, Padrino Profesor Sánchez, Vicerrectores y Gerente y Responsable también de Profesorado, Defensor Universitario, Directores y Decano de Escuelas y Facultad, Directores de Centro, de Institutos de Investigación y de Departamentos, Profesorado, Personal de Administración y Servicios, Estudiantes, estimados todos. Celebramos hoy la investidura como doctor honoris causa del profesor Goyatadeli a propuesta de la Escuela Técnica Superior de Ingenieros de Caminos, Canales y Puertos, actuando el profesor José Ángel Sánchez Fernández como padrino. Querido profesor Adeli, bienvenido al claustro de nuestra universidad, la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. Now let me switch into English to address directly to the new doctor honoris causa. It's my honor and my privilege to welcome you to our academic community. The Government Council of this University approves your appointment as Dr. Honoris Causa to distinguish your extraordinary professional achievements in different fields of engineering. Professor Adeli, you are an example for our students and a magister for our faculties. And since now, you will be formally joined to our institution. Your portrait will be in our gallery of distinguished Dr. Honoris Causa. Thank you very much for accepting this recognition that we can give to you today. Dear Professor Adeli, now let me switch again into Spanish. Uh, volvemos de nuevo al español. Celebramos la incorporación a nuestro claustro de un docente y un investigador de indudable prestigio internacional en muchos ámbitos, que abarcan desde la ingeniería civil a las ciencias de la salud, pero en el que, tal como nos ha destacado su padrino, el profesor Sánchez en su laudatio, podemos encontrar un claro hilo conductor a todas estas contribuciones. 
como así mismo también el doctor Adeli nos ha dicho cómo ligaba desde el ámbito del civil engineering a la biomedical engineering. Profesor Adeli, académico correspondiente de la Real Academic, Academia de Ingeniería de España, ha sabido aplicar tecnologías utilizadas en ámbitos de la ingeniería civil y de la construcción y especialmente ayudado por el uso de las ciencias de la computación a ámbitos como son la neurología o las ciencias de la salud. La destacada trayectoria científica del profesor Adeli ilustra claramente la evolución que está sucediendo en la ingeniería. La ingeniería que consiste en aplicar de manera rigurosa los conocimientos científicos a las técnicas y tecnologías utilizadas para la resolución de problemas. En el final del siglo XVIII, en 1772, ya se vislumbraba la ventaja que podía aportar a la Armada Española la creación de una escuela que estructurara todos los saberes en torno a la construcción y a la navegabilidad de los navíos y eso condujo a la creación de la primera escuela de ingenieros navales, la que está incorporada hoy en nuestra Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. A continuación, se creó una escuela de ingenieros de montes responsable de aportar las materias primas que se necesitaban para la construcción de estos mismos buques. A mediados del siglo XIX se vio la necesidad de formar a los primeros profesionales capaces de mejorar los rendimientos obtenidos de las explotaciones agrícolas y ganaderas. Y así se fueron creando los diferentes cuerpos de ingenieros, que no me he querido dejar ninguno, aunque por el medio en las fechas había alguno, alguno más, como es la ingeniería de minas, etc. Por lo tanto, mencionamos ahora ingenieros navales, de montes, de minas, agrónomos, industriales, de caminos, canales y puertos, de telecomunicación o aeronáuticos. Se empezó por dominar de forma aplicada Disciplinas científicas como las matemáticas, la física, la química y la ideación gráfica, corpus de conocimiento que constituían la formación inicial de los ingenieros hasta finales del siglo pasado para resolver problemas mecánicos o eléctricos. Y esto produjo la primera revolución industrial. Se dominaron las estructuras y las técnicas constructivas y eso ha permitido en los países desarrollados, como ha indicado tu padrino, querido José Ángel, que las infraestructuras de comunicaciones y, sobre todo, que el agua potable y la salubridad llegue a todos nuestros ciudadanos. Se dominaron disciplinas como la mecánica de fluidos, la propulsión y la aerodinámica, y eso ha permitido el desarrollo de la ingeniería aeronáutica y del espacio. Más tarde, los avances en la electrónica permitieron la fabricación de los ordenadores y, con ellos, el desarrollo de la ingeniería informática. El desarrollo de las tecnologías de la información y de las comunicaciones han permitido que dispongamos actualmente en nuestro móvil de un acceso permanente a multitud de servicios que día a día siguen transformando nuestra sociedad, la revolución digital en estos momentos. Con el avance de los conocimientos en biología y con las aportaciones facilitadas por el desarrollo de la informática y la electrónica, aparecen nuevos campos donde extender la manera de pensar de los ingenieros Aparecen nuevos ámbitos y entre ellos, por supuesto, esa expansión a las ciencias de la vida. La formación de unos cuerpos de profesionales específicamente capacitados y cualificados para resolver los problemas de la administración pública, origen de nuestras escuelas, contribuyó de forma determinante al desarrollo de nuestra sociedad. Vemos ahora la ventaja que aporta la aplicación de esta manera de pensar ingenieril a nuestros ámbitos. Ingenieros como Leonardo Torres Quevedo aportaron su conocimiento a desarrollar sistemas como el transbordador del Niágara, que en el año 2016 celebró su primer centenario sin un solo accidente en sus más de 100 años de funcionamiento. El ajedrecista o el telequino, primer mando a distancia reconocido por, como Milestone por el Cubo, fue, por un lado, por el fuerte fundamento científico-tecnológico de su formación y, por el otro lado, por otro lado, por la contribución de esa componente de ingenio, esa manera de pensar fuera de la caja, out of the box, que llevamos en nuestro nombre y que siempre nos ha caracterizado. Esta manera de pensar ingenieril ha creado tecnologías. Con estas tecnologías se han fabricado productos y con estas tecnologías y productos se han desarrollado servicios y modificado procesos con el objetivo de mejorar la calidad de vida de nuestros ciudadanos. Si la ingeniería inicialmente se ocupó de desarrollar la tecnología y luego buscaba en qué productos o procesos se podía aplicar, a finales del siglo pasado pasamos a un planteamiento donde era el rendimiento económico de un nuevo servicio lo que lideraba un desarrollo tecnológico o una innovación. Y estamos ahora en un paradigma en el que hemos puesto al usuario y a su problema en el centro de este desarrollo. 
Si la tecnología lideró el proceso en los estadios iniciales, es ahora el usuario quien está en el centro de este proceso. Querido profesor Adeli, querido Oyat, tu trayectoria aplicando los conocimientos científico-tecnológicos en ámbitos donde no se utilizaban antes demuestra que esa manera de pensar out of the box, esa aproximación a la resolución de los problemas desde otros puntos de vista, esa capacidad de trabajar con expertos de diferentes campos en equipos multidisciplinares, constituyen las bases que van a posibilitar los mayores avances en nuestra sociedad. Querido profesor Adeli, querido Oyat, tu trayectoria vital pone de manifiesto también otra cosa, la necesidad que tenemos de luchar contra esas imposiciones que siguen perviviendo en algunas sociedades. En un mundo global que quiera desarrollarse de forma armónica no hay lugar para dictaduras. Un mundo que quiera seguir avanzando de forma armónica sin dejarse a nadie atrás, como es el acordado por Naciones Unidas en sus 17 Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. En ese mundo no hay hueco para planeamientos dictatoriales. Los 198 países que formamos Naciones Unidas nos hemos comprometido a alcanzar en el año 2030 a través de los 17 Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible y sus 169 medidas asociadas un mundo más justo, un mundo respetuoso con el planeta, un mundo que avance, pero sin dejarse a nadie detrás. No one left behind. Como Universidad Politécnica de Madrid hemos aceptado este compromiso y queremos contribuir de forma relevante a través de nuestra investigación, a través de, de las enseñanzas que impartimos siguiendo en nuestro empeño de una formación básica amplia, como pedía el profesor José Ángel Sánchez, y por supuesto poniendo en la punta de la vanguardia la especialización en el tramo final de la formación y todo ello a través de nuestro compromiso con la sociedad que nos financia y a través de las alianzas que podamos poner en marcha para que esto se haga una realidad. Dicen los expertos que aún podríamos estar a tiempo para revertir el cambio climático, pero tenemos que empezar a actuar ya. Estamos a tiempo de desarrollar políticas para mejorar la igualdad, estamos a tiempo de contribuir a proporcionar una educación de calidad, estamos a tiempo de mejorar la salud y el bienestar de nuestra sociedad, estamos a tiempo de aplicar medidas para paliar la lacra del hambre en el mundo, estamos a tiempo de limpiar y evitar contaminar más nuestros mares, estamos a tiempo de hacer las cosas de otro modo para que nuestro mundo en el año 2030 sea diferente y nos hemos comprometido a ello pero tenemos que empezar ya porque no tenemos tiempo que perder. Querido José Ángel, muchas gracias por elevar la propuesta para este nombramiento. La investidura como doctor honoris causa del profesor Adeli es un orgullo para nuestra universidad. Querido profesor Adeli, querido Oyad, muchas gracias por aceptar tu incorporación al claustro de nuestra universidad, de la ya tuya Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. A partir de hoy eres ya uno de nosotros. Bienvenido. Y para finalizar, ya llega el momento de los agradecimientos. Quiero agradecer a todo el personal de la universidad que ha hecho posible este acto. Personal de protocolo, de servicios centrales, de audiovisuales, de comunicación, de las diferentes consejerías, del GATE. Personal también de otras escuelas que habéis venido a echarnos una mano. Quiero agradecer también siempre a nuestro coro y a los representantes, en su caso, que a veces nos acompañan en estos actos también de la Orquesta Sinfónica de nuestra Universidad. Hoy está nuestro coro presente una vez más y saben que siempre les digo que no son ningún adorno a ningún acto, sino parte integral siempre de los actos solemnes de la Universidad. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias a todos ustedes por su asistencia. Nos ponemos en pie para escuchar solemnemente el himno universitario, por favor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 